Funding for Firing Line is made possible by the financial support of viewers like you and by a major grant from the John M. Olin Foundation, Incorporated. Additional support is provided by the Mobile Corporation, Farley Industries, Incorporated, Monarch Financial Services, Incorporated, Payne Weber, and the Friends of Firing Line. My name is Skyler Chapin, and we are, of course, on firing line, but with an interesting difference, because this half hour in Phoenix will include members of the Phoenix Symphony, its conductor, James Sedaris, and a rehearsal of Bach's F minor concerto for harpsichord and orchestra, in which our regular host will play what might be described as a major role. I'm interested in all this because my life has been devoted to music and the arts. In the 1970s, I was general manager of the Metropolitan Opera, and in the 80s, until last year, dean of the School of the Arts at Columbia University, and served as chairman of the American Symphony Orchestra League, the service organization that represents over 875 of the 1,500 symphony orchestras in the United States. We want to discuss with Mr. Buckley, and also Mr. Sedaris, uh, two broad themes. First of these is with the technological blessings of the 20th century, radio, television, the phonograph, and now the compact disc, what's going to happen to music at what might be called the regional level? Don't we need to encourage the fine professional orchestras as we have in Phoenix, Arizona? which we don't hear regularly on television or radio. And what about the lost amateur? There were more keyboard artists in individual German provinces 200 years ago than there are in the entire world today. How do we encourage young men and women who study the piano or the violin or sing to continue to be active musically at a non-professional level? Let's hear from Mr. Buckley, beginning, uh, in the beginning. Um, how did we get into what you have called this mess? <laughs> well, uh, it, it uh, began with a letter sent by the manager of this orchestra. Some people suspect he was drunk when he sent it. <laughs> but in any, in, any, in any event, it asked me whether it, at any time in 1989 or 1990, um, I would consent to play a harpsichord concerto by Bach with this symphony orchestra. I, I, I read it a dozen times, wondering whether it was serious, and blinked my eyes. Uh, and then I started thinking, uh, as, as, as you might have done, as almost anybody has done, you get sort of a Walter Mitty rush, uh, which, uh, which happened to me. In, in any event, um, here I am, 14 months uh, later. But uh, you've raised some pretty impo important themes, and I think w we should discuss them. What, in fact, does one do in an age in which you can get uh, the Vienna Philharmonic? Uh, uh, how do you sustain 850 uh, orchestras, let alone orchestras of this particular quality? You ought to know. You are head of the organization charged with that uh, mandate. Well, it is, a, it is an extraordinary richness, as you know, that the, uh, we have in the orchestral field in America. In fact, we are, without question, the leader in this artistic venture in the world. Why? Well, first of all, sheer numbers. We have 1,500 orchestras, which range from amateurs to, of course, the major professionals. They have budgets of uh, something like two or $3,000, up to the latest announced figure of the Boston Symphony for this next year, which is $30 million. Well, is, this, is this a measure of American affluence, or is it a measure of a, 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 a distinctively identified American cultural inclination to find music? Well, why do we have more per capita uh, musicians here than, say, in Italy? One of the reasons we have is that the orchestras were part of the American scene almost from the beginning. As our basic first immigrants were European, they brought with them certain cultural feelings for their homelands. A statistic that uh, people find quite extraordinary is that, for example, Beethoven's first symphony had its premiere in Vienna in 1800. 
It had its premiere in America in 1813, barely 13 years later, with an orchestra that no longer exists in, in Pennsylvania. It's funny, because you, you, you sort of don't think of the pilgrims uh, singing anything other than onward Christian soldiers, do you? <laughs> they, no, but the pilgrims uh, were succeeded by the Puritans, after all. The Puritans but they weren't very musical, were they? No, they weren't terribly musical, but the people who came after them were. Yeah, yeah. And the fact is that we have had this heritage. Uh, we have, for example, if you name the three oldest continuing orchestras in the world, two of them are American. It's always startles people, but it happens to be true. Yeah. I'm not now talking about orchestras in Europe like the Gewandhaus or the Leipzig, or whatever, that have come and gone and come and gone. But yeah. in sense of continuous performance, the three oldest in the world are the Vienna Philharmonic and the New York Philharmonic in 1842, both of them started, and the third is the St. Louis Orchestra. And that, of course, was because of the German immigration across the country and the settlement in St. Louis of that particular group who wanted quickly a Zingverein and please aber yes an orchestra. Well, and, and of course, to have orchestras, you've got to have people who want to play in them. And uh, since in order to qualify to play in an orchestra like this, you've got to be good, uh, it means you get you know, the top two or three out of, say, 100. Now, how does America compare with other countries in terms of people who begin the study of music? In this country, we have always specialized in training instrumentalists. Uh, European orchestral players get their basic training in opera houses, but we haven't, opera is a relatively new phenomenon in this country. Really didn't come into any permanent uh, position until the, after the Civil War. But orchestra musicians have always been a part of the fabric, teaching, uh, chamber music, uh, symphonies. Uh, this has been something that we have had and has become a sort of automatic part of our culture without paying that much attention to it. Now we, we at a point, for example, statistics can be very boring, but this is, I think, rather <coughs> interesting. I mentioned there were 1,500 orchestras. They employ 75,000 musicians. They get the services of trustees numbering 40,000. Uh, they are budgeted now a total of $600 million. Uh, they engage the services and the actions in the interests of 250,000 volunteers. How much of all that money is federal money? Very little, Mr. Buckley, very little indeed. <laughs> in point of fact, federal, state, and local money support for orchestras totals 8.3%. Cross your heart? Cross my heart. <laughs> Not only that, but of course, where does the rest of the money come from? It comes from the box office and it comes from the private sector. And in the course of the years ahead, I hope that the uh, federal, state, and local percentage will rise from 8.3% to at least 20%, mm -hmm. which I think is a perfectly fair ratio. Maybe that's why they didn't make you national commissioner of the arts. Uh. Well, that's entirely possible, but I hope the man who has it will push on in the same way. <laughs> But the, the, the real fact here is that, that, that local support from communities such as Phoenix uh, and communities all across the country are what make it possible for orchestras to, uh, to exist. Okay, well, what, what about the, uh, the second theme that uh, you touched on? I was in casual conversation with a man very high up in the organization of this uh, symphony, I won't name him, who majored in voice who um, at one point had memorized the 12 variations by Mozart on Twinkle, Twinkle, Little Star, who hasn't played a note for 10 years or sung with a choral group. Uh, why is there that vast uh, 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 cemetery of people who gave up active participation in music, settling for an exclusively passive role listening to professionals uh, like these, is it because they can't achieve the kind of satisfaction that their ears have trained them to expect of others, or, or what, what is the reason for it? Well, I think you've asked a very complicated and interesting question. It's my business. I know it is. <laughs> and you do it extraordinarily well. However, you must give me a chance to try to answer it. And uh, in the process, uh, I think that a great many people who start out in life, perhaps with an idea that they are going to be the new Isaac Stern or the, or the new uh, Feltzmann or whatever you like, 
and then find that while they are gifted, they don't have that extra quality that allows special recognition on the part of the public. People who are interested in brass instruments, in woodwinds, in percussions, of course, know that basically if they're going to be professional musicians, they're going to be playing in an orchestra. Mm -hmm. There aren't <coughs> that many solo percussionists around the world. Although here and there we have a few solo oboists and trumpeters. But the fact is that they're prepared for the discipline of ensemble playing. The ones who sometimes suffer the most in terms of disappointment, for that is, I think, part of what you're asking, are string players many of whom, particularly violinists, uh, don't start out in life with the idea of playing in an ensemble, mm -hmm. except perhaps chamber music. Um, and like everything, um, water does find you know, the right level. If you are qualified and have the talent for a career as a professional musician, at this point in our country, even though the, the remuneration may be modest to a large degree, it is still possible for people to earn not a huge, but a reasonable living as a professional musician. Yeah, but what, what, about, uh, what about people who don't achieve that level of um, skill, uh, uh, and yet there seems to be such little demand for them, singers, for instance. Mm -hmm. uh, how, how many people participate uh, other than, say, in, in church services, in, in, in choral groups? Or, or, or even, as you say, in, uh, in chamber groups. Uh, uh, you know, how, how much playing, say, at, at my level rather than uh, at uh, their level, wh what is there about our culture that discourages a continuing enjoyment of the musical experience? I don't think uh, our culture does discourage that. There is a very interesting volume put out by chamber I could, music. I could America. ask you an embarrassing question. Mm. If you add your children to my siblings, how many of them play any instrument? Um, two of my children. Oh, is that right? That's mm -hmm. pretty good. Because um, only one of mine does, and I had ten. Uh, they, were all, they were all taught, but only one actually bothers to play an instrument. Oh, you said siblings. I'm sorry, I thought you were talking about children. No, none of my siblings. Uh, I, I was the only one who played. And fortunately, I had a teacher early on, a brilliant teacher of composition, who told me I didn't have any talent. And it didn't waste any words about it, and suggested there was a whole other world of music in which one could find a satisfactory life, and I've been lucky enough to do that. But you asked about singing, which you were speaking about singing. The fact is that a great many people enjoy amateur singing, choruses, churches, whatever. For example, if you are uh, uh, somebody who has taken music as a profession out of your life, but you still like to play the fiddle or the vi or viola or cello or whatever, Chamber Music America has a, has a guide, which you can subscribe to. You list yourself, being as honest as you can, whether you are a novice, an intermediate, or a professional. Mm -hmm. And the guide lists people's names in towns and cities all over the world. I didn't know that. So if you want to, if you want to have some chamber music and you're in uh, Zurich, or if you want to have some chamber music and you're in, in Manhattan, Kansas, you look through and find out if there are people in that town. It's who like sex. Well, I mean, uh, <laughs> in one way, perhaps. <laughs> it, it, well, it's just certainly in terms of um, uh, um, the idea of being, being to coordinate people exactly. who have uh, exactly. certain appetites. It is a... Uh, the, the, the excitement, though, and the thing that is, that is, that is terribly important is that the, the, the future of orchestras such as the Phoenix Orchestra and orchestras in Charlottesville or in Dayton or whatever your town you like to mention, they are now in competition with the electronic media. They are now in competition with the CD, with the absolutely excellent, impeccable, flawless performance. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. It is up to the music directors of these orchestras and their trustees a combination leadership to make certain that what these orchestras do as, as basic artistic instruments brings an excitement to the community that would not ordinarily be there. The programming, the standards of performance, the idea that people can have all the CDs and the electronics they want, but then it's they come the in, thing, yeah. it's not the mm -hmm. same thing, because there is no sound that replaces the sound of live musicians. Yeah. No sound in the world. Perhaps we ought to ask Mr. Sedaris to come in and have a little comment about that. Well, I should think he'd be qualified to opine on the subject. 
What has he said that has provoked you the most? Well, I think this wonderful comment about amateurs and uh, one thing that has happened in this country is that the schools have really, the public schools have really fallen down on their job of providing this kind of training and exposure. And one reason that uh, professional football and professional sports does as well as they do in audience and, and ticket buyers is that most of the people that go to these sports at one time played these sports. All the boys and many of the young girls now are playing sports. So they, have, they are participants and have an appreciation for the for well, the are, are you saying that the public schools don't offer it or that there are not students there who ask for it? No, it's, it's being less and less offered. And when budgets get tight, the first things to get cut, unfortunately, are the fine arts. The no, strings and uh, that is one of the curses of the education yeah. system as, as it is now. The arts are deemed to be superfluous, extra, luxurious, out they go. I mean, it is the most ridiculous business that we have in this country where the arts are given such short shrift. After all, if you want to take the most basic fact in history, what does a civilization have left when it is finished except its arts? Well, okay, but then how, how, if what you say is endemic, are we going to continue to feed and create 1,500 symphony orchestras, as Scarlett Chapin has just told us? Uh, in fact, where did they learn how to play? if not through the public schools? Well, they learn from private teachers, sometimes associated with schools and sometimes not. So they had to be yeah. affluent, or well, relatively affluent. Well, they had to be able to you know, afford uh, the lessons and the instrument. Afford private instruction, right. in other words. Right, right. And uh, for instance, in Phoenix, do the public schools offer violin to students who want to study it? Most, many, I should say many of the school districts here in Phoenix, in the Phoenix metropolitan area, do offer string teaching and things, but it's not uh, across the board. There are some districts that have no instruction. I think uh, perhaps uh, looking at my watch and whatever, that you might want to consider the fact that you're about to undertake a rehearsal. Well, I think it would probably be a good idea. Do you want to give it a whirl? Yes, sir. Yeah. Okay, good. Thank you. 
Funding for Firing Line is made possible by the financial support of viewers like you and by a major grant from the John M. Olin Foundation, Incorporated. Additional support is provided by the Mobile Corporation, Farley Industries, Incorporated, Monarch Financial Services, Incorporated, Payne Weber, and the Friends of Firing Line. This program was produced by SICA, which is solely responsible for its content. For a printed bound transcript of this program, send $3 to Firing Line, Post Office Box 5966, Columbia, South Carolina, 29250. Indicate the subject of the program and please allow three weeks for delivery. This is PBS. William F. Buckley, Jr. offers 20 years of firing line guests from the 60s to the 80s. For 1995, you can receive this companion book by calling 1-800-872-8642. Credit cards are acceptable. Or send a check to Firing Line, 2700 Cypress Street, Columbia, South Carolina, 29205.